tell you that Maricela and Dr. Oma left at lunchtime. I think they were bombarded by too many questions. So I'm here to replace her for this particular session, so you have to bear with me. Um, what I was going to deal with, and there's so many issues that have been raised today. Please note I'm not Dr. Oma for now. Yeah? So any questions that were addressed to Oma, ignore until the plenary session. Um, but I'll start off with a very interesting issue the, that was raised uh, in relation to traditional knowledge. And I think it covers quite a number of things because we're looking at issues of uh, folklore, otherwise known as traditional cultural expressions. We're looking at traditional knowledge as it relates to various manufacturing processes that result in products that we use in the pharmaceutical industry, medical. I think there are so many things we can look into. Probably if I look at the, you know, the murals we have on the wall, it could be something that is inspired by traditional arts. Now, the, the research that I carried out for purposes of open air was basically to look at the policy context in which we can uh, create traditional knowledge commons. And I think in the morning, um, Douglas touched on, um, what was it called? Free what? Freemium which is basically something within the, the, the creative commons uh, model. So basically whereby you put out your copyright work and uh, people are able to access that work but under specific terms and conditions. Um, sorry, the poet over here, I've forgotten her name. She had raised, uh, Jerry. Jerry had said that, you know, basically, uh, Jerry and someone else from this other side, the issue of piracy and putting out things online and alternative business models, but for copyright owners, sometimes you find that using the creative commons is going to serve the purpose because number one, it gets your work out there free of charge. But number two, it's based on six specific uh, licenses. So basically anybody who uses that particular work cannot use it for commercial purposes. So your work will still be able to go out. People will get access because I think for most of the creative artists, one of the biggest issues is to get that fame. You want as much as possible to go out. So the Creative Commons is a, is a very good way. I mean, it's one of the, the options that have come out, and they're still based on copyright because there's assumption that you own the copyright in that particular work. So you cannot go, go to the Creative Commons, use that particular work, and then, you know, like for instance, if you're talking about open source uh, software, I cannot use um, the Linux system, to take it out, modify it, create a commercial product, and sell it as proprietary software. That is one of the no-nos in terms of the Creative Commons. So basically, on the same angle, I was looking at issues of traditional knowledge. Is there any way that we can have a traditional knowledge commons whereby we can be able to put out the traditional knowledge for other people to use but within a specific uh, framework? Because as it stands right now within the research, sorry, I always get carried away. So half of the time, don't follow my, my what do you call it? My slides, they're normally a dummy. So, <laughs> so what, would, what normally happens is that you have traditional knowledge and in this particular case you've had issues in, especially in relation to traditional cultural expressions. So you have issues like um, uh, handicrafts, which I think are very common, the issue of the, the Maasai market that probably you have raised and as uh, Dr. Sihanya said that one probably you'll be able to deal with it if it's within the frame of, I mean, the framework of copyright law you're actually better off dealing with industrial designs because the industrial designs are actually um, registered. So it's very, you know, it's very easy for you to follow up. But at the same time, when I was carrying out my studies, you find that one of the communities which I carried, I, I did a study within two communities, the Mijikenda and the Maasai, and they said one of the saddest things is that when an elder dies, they die with the knowledge. And I think this is very true. My grandmother was a medicine woman of sorts, but at that time when I was growing up, I never quite thought about it. When you go to the village and you eat a lot of food, which most kids are wont to do, and you're browsing together with the cows when you're going to graze, so by the time you come home, you have a stomach upset. And she'd go out into her little garden, get some leaves, boil them, and give them to you. My grandmother passed away uh, in 1995. At that particular point in time, I couldn't care less about traditional uh, knowledge. And she had so many interesting remedies, some of which right now when I think about it, I, would, I don't have anyone to get that information from now that I have an interest in traditional knowledge as it relates to medicine. Um, for instance, many people eat uh, maize and beans, githeri. 
For my grandmother, it was a no-no. You would never eat githeri with tea, with milk. That, that was never done. After eating githeri, you are given a cup of black tea without sugar. At that particular point, we thought it was a punishment. But later in life, you find that it actually helps you sort out the gas problems. Try taking githeri with a glass of, I mean, with a cup of tea with milk and see what will happen to you after that. It's going to be quite explosive. So uh, we never quite thought about it at that particular point, but she's gone, and she's gone with the knowledge. And that's the problem that we're encountering right now. We've got so much of that traditional knowledge that relates, as I say, to medicine, art, everything, but we do not have access to it. That's the reason why I wanted to look at how the legal framework, as well as the policy framework, can facilitate the creation of a traditional knowledge commons, which can enable us access this particular knowledge, more so for collaborative creativity, and basically anchor it on uh, open development, which I think is something that the Open Air Project is looking into to help us um, develop. And I think the whole context is how do we make intellectual property work for us? So that's basically where uh, my, my research was uh, coming in from. So, you know, we basically involved, as I said, the, the Mijikenda community and the Maasai. You might ask me why I picked those two communities. The Mijikenda community have a very strong TK system, and uh, basically you have all these Kaya systems. Um, and the time when we went to carry out the studies, they have, they've even started trying to document that particular work. Then the Maasai, uh, and the World Intellectual Property uh, Organization, were involved in a digitization project. It's called the dig digitization of the Maasai culture. So basically, there are some people who are taken, trained, they are trying to capture most of these issues in terms of traditional uh, Maasai uh, knowledge to put it, but mainly they are dealing with issues of culture and, and uh, heritage. So the other respondents that I had were US Truly, the Kenya Copyright Board, National Museums, the Kenya Industrial Property Institute, uh, just to see, because these are the main players in terms of traditional knowledge, to see how best we can uh, engage them in the area of policy making. So, as it stands, traditional knowledge doesn't have what you'd call a straight jacket definition. As Dr. Sihanya said, traditionally, most of us think of it in terms of knowledge that is passed on from one person to another. Uh, it's normally from generation to generation. But it goes beyond that because you have works that are inspired by traditional uh, knowledge. Incidentally, we always had a set of rules, customs, and taboos that basically uh, govern how we use this particular traditional knowledge. If I go back to the issue of my grandmother, the person who probably she would have passed that knowledge to is one of my uh, aunties or uncles, and then from there they would have passed it on to the, you know, the next generation. So basically, it wasn't, um, I would know the herbs that she has, but she, she was not going to be the one to tell me, Maricela, come in, these are the hubs that I think you should use for A, B, C, and D. She'd probably just get me if she thinks that I have an inclination towards uh, traditional medicine. So you'd find that not practically everyone in the community would have that particular knowledge. The Kaya system was very interesting, and this one goes ahead, I think, when you were reading about Okonkwo and everybody, uh, things fall apart and all, you had the evil forest. You have the Njurin Cheke in uh, Meru. They have this particular forest, the sacred forest. And most of the time, none of us sat down to think. We'd probably say, I'm not going to go into that forest because number one, it's sacred. Number two, it's evil. Something bad will happen to me. But yet the medicine men and the healers and all those people were allowed to get into the forest to, to deal with this. So the taboos basically stopping you from getting into the forest to preserve you know, any genetic resources that would be required. Because any time somebody had an ailment, the medicine man was the same, same person who jumped into there evil forest. So they actually had systems to ensure that we preserve this particular knowledge and, and, and culture. But I think somewhere along the way in our transition from traditional, the, the traditional uh, uh, cultural economies to what we are headed to right now, we lost quite a bit of that. And many people have this misconception that traditional knowledge belongs to the public domain. You know, yet we find that we had the systems. So, um, there's many cases whereby we'd have, um, I mean, what, looking into that entire uh, context, I tried to figure out what exactly am I going to look into. And that's basically what my research was uh, based, into, based on. 
and uh, I had a couple of assistants. Um, initially, the research was supposed to cover both Kenya and Nigeria, but unfortunately, my Nigerian counterpart was not able to, to um, you know, appear because of uh, domestic issues. So how and to what extent does the Kenyan legal policy environment uh, you know, cater for the creation and implementation of a traditional knowledge context in the context of this whole uh, open development under the open air uh, policy. So when you're looking at protection of traditional knowledge, there are basically two systems. And I think this is where normally the IP system comes in, and that's defensive. You have the defensive protection. So it basically aims to protect people from outside the community from utilizing that particular work. So you know, like, basically, if you look at what the Swakopmund uh, protocol, uh, which is under the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, the main purpose of having that was to provide that particular defensive protection, to stop other people from dealing with that. Though if you read it further down, you hope that somewhere along the line you get a protective uh, kind of, um, uh, a positive kind of protection. So that on one hand, it allows access, but at the same time, it ensures that those who own or those who are custodians of the traditional knowledge have uh, access and benefit from that particular. I mean, it provides access and at the same time, the custodians benefit from it. So you find that um, in the current uh, IP system, you might find areas where you can apply the existing intellectual property law. For instance, um, you have geographical indications, uh, law, which can actually be applied to um, protect certain genetic resources. Um, you have, like I said, the industrial de designs. You have the performances when it comes to traditional cultural expressions. Because you see, the thing is that the performance is what is going to be protected, the, the fixation of that particular performance. But that will not stop a third party from, like, let's say, from um, playing the song Wanamberi. You know, like, though that's not exactly a, 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 what you call it, it's not a TCE because the owner is known. I think it was done sometime in the 50s. But if you think of a, like the Meru lullabies, these have been sung from generation to generation. So I remember there was a time one of the Kenyan artists, Barbara Guantai, she compiled a whole album on uh, Meru lullabies, and she came to the Kenyan Copyright Board and requested for authority because that's basically what is provided for under the Copyright uh, Act. So the performance that Barbara Guantai and the sound recording that she had, that basically she has the protection under the copyright system to the sound recording and the performance. But the underlying lyrics and the, you know, the underlying copyright work, she cannot get copyright in that work because it's deemed to be work that belongs to the traditional cultural um, expressions. So when you're looking at the whole issue of commons, I, I started off by talking about the creative commons. So it basically derives from the idea that a community owns the property. And I think this is the concept that many people, again, when I was talking to my colleague over here, start off from the premise that Africans do not have the concept of property, which half of the time I say, I'm sorry, that is total rubbish. I mean, all of you, if you are to put up your phones right now, phones? Who owns those phones? Sorry? Tobias, it's yours? It's yours, Carol? Does it belong to the community that you come from? So the concept of ownership, even traditionally as much as people say that we had, we had communal property, but the property was very specific. So you still had my outfit, whether it was a sarong or whatever it is that people were wearing then, my shoes, my blankets, my kitchen. You know, in fact, I think women were very territorial. This is my kitchen. For those who came from polygamous families, I shall not share it with my co-wife. If you look at any traditional setting, each wife had their own, own kitchen. But at the same time, things like land and there are certain resources which were actually owned collectively. So for instance, the issue of the Kyondos, which is basically the Kikuyu in Eastern Kenya, who, came up, who are dealing with those baskets. So you'd know, if I need to get a good Kyondo, this is the community which I am going to go to. So try as I may, if I landed in Kisi, I'm not going to get the Kyondo, which I wanted. So it would be known that that is basically something that comes from that community. But at the same time, you'd have specific artisans who would be dealing with those uh, particular works. And this was made very clear when you were talking to both the, 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 
the teens among the Nijikenda and the, and the Maasai. So you find that certain resources, both tangible and intangible, are shared. And this one is underlined, certain resources, not all resources, they're shared by the community. So they're guided by predetermined rules, again, and regulations. So I was talking about the whole issue of the taboos, the customs, the rules, you know, there are all those things that basically dealt with this issue. So we have the material commons. Uh, someone in the morning talked about the social commons, but basically just in, in context. And then we have the knowledge commons, and that's basically where you are looking at the issue of creative commons. And at the same time, when you're looking at all these traditional cultural expressions, uh, sorry, when I'm talking about traditional knowledge over here, it covers the entire spectrum, including traditional cultural expressions, which otherwise are known as, is known as folklore. So you find that the resources basically are non-rival and non-substructive. -substruct -sub so that means that if I have something here, you know, it's unlike a loaf of bread. If I have a loaf of bread, Professor Sihanya takes half of it, then I don't have half of the loaf of bread. But if I have these intangible goods, you find that as much as somebody has taken away my creative work, I still remain with the work. So you know, you, it's, it's, the, it's what produces that final uh, product. So those are the issues that you're looking at when you're looking at the com uh, commons. So it involves a continual and uh, movement uh, of the knowledge. So you find that members of one TK Commons stand to, to benefit from each other because there's continual movement of knowledge within the traditional uh, knowledge commons. So it's, it's, it's actually something that encourages uh, growth. And I thought it's something that we need to look into when you're looking at the TK Commons. So some of the presumptions I was looking at when I was drafting, uh, working on this is that there's need to preserve and protect the traditional knowledge. And I think that is something I hope we all agree upon. Preservation and protection should not inhibit access. Um, if you take, I don't know how many of you have heard um, Alexander McCall Smith. He's a Scottish uh, writer who has written a lot about uh, African culture. And he read, he, he's written a book about this, um, what do you call it, detective agency, and uh, based in Botswana. And then after that, he also has an anthology of uh, African short stories. And it was amazing. Reading those stories was taking a walk back in time in my grandmother's kitchen because they were exactly the same as what my grandmother would say, but he says he picked them from Zimbabwe. And when I spoke from my colleagues from Zimbabwe, yes, those are the stories they had. The stories of the, what do you call it, the, the crafty uh, hair. We all have that story. You know, all this, the stories, if, if you ever have a chance to read the, the anthology that is written by Alexander McCall Smith, most of you will identify most of those stories, uh, unless you are .com, since I don't think you, <laughs> you have the opportunity of sitting by the, the fireplace with your grandmother. So when you grant access, you know, like basically, you, you, we want to preserve the TK, but at the same time, we want other people to be able to use it. Like the knowledge which my grandmother has, if there is no access to it, to whose benefit shall it be? And then you do not want restrictive access as well. <laughs> So in Kenya, yeah, you have the legal and policy framework. Of course, you have the Constitution of Kenya. And uh, when you're dealing with traditional cultural expressions, you go back to uh, Article 11.2. That one basically talks about protection of culture, uh, you know, cultural uh, uh, culture and her heritage and intellectual property rights. We have the intellectual property laws. I don't think I'm going to bother going through all of them. But basically, if you're looking at copyright, trademarks, industrial, uh, industrial property, among others, and under copyright, we have specific provisions under Section 2, which basically um, seeks to define folklore. And then when you go under Section 9, it gives the guidelines as to how you can use folkloric exp expressions. Then you have the National Traditional Knowledge uh, Policy of 2010, and the National Policy on Culture and Heritage. At the moment, the IP policy is still in the draft uh, stage, so we haven't quite adopted it but we hope these are some of the issues that you're going to, to address. Um, back, sorry, back on the issue of uh, the policy framework, you find that the national intellectual, uh, I mean, uh, traditional knowledge policy basically seeks to, the same thing that I was talking about, it seeks to preserve the intellectual, I mean, the, the traditional knowledge, but at the same time provide access. 
So it tries to give that particular balance. And right now we are working on the legal uh, framework to try and see how we can protect uh, both traditional knowledge and traditional cult cultural expressions. Genetic resources are proving to be quite difficult because we haven't quite figured out which uh, organization would spearhead that particular uh, process. So the use of intellectual uh, um, information communication technology, this is an area whereby at start of, start, first of all start off with the Maasai digital uh, project under WIPO. So you find there are so many of their cultural practices, song, dance, which have been captured on, on video and there's a library. Unfortunately, like the person whom I was dealing with is the one who was heading this particular project. Nobody knows of the library. How many Kenyans even know that there's a digital library that deals with Maasai culture? What was supposed to happen is that this was supposed to be re replicated. This was actually a pilot project and it was supposed to be replicated in all communities across the country so that we don't lose the, the, the knowledge. And I remember the respondent was telling me that when a Maasai elder dies, he dies with the knowledge. So one of the things we are trying to do is to capture that knowledge. Then there's the issue of the traditional knowledge digital library. And this is something that has been done in India. And I think it was inspired by a case, um, um, this one involving the patent that was granted for the turmeric in the US uh, patent office. So basically, which was later revoked. But one of the things that the Indian government did is that they have this huge library of traditional knowledge because there are so many things that we, we, uh, we might want to come up with, um, uh, what do you call it, products under the patent system or whatever it is and more often that not there's the issue of novelty and whatever it is. But now there's the element of disclosure. So by providing the knowledge, number one, they should be able to come and negotiate with you to tell you, I mean as the a TK custodian, and tell you that we'd like to use this particular work for A, B, C, and D, and then you can negotiate on issues of access and benefit sharing. If you want to have the works used, well and good. If you don't want, you can tell them, please don't touch. But as it stands right now, we have so many people who are just coming in, going and carrying out studies in different parts of the country, collecting whatever material they need, and then they go and basically get patents over them. They'll get, um, what do you call it, industrial designs, they'll get, um, copyright protection, they, they, you know, they'll do all sorts of interesting things. So the use of ICT applications and software to create works is something that uh, we can look into. Um, this is now looking at broadly the relationship with copyright. At the beginning when I lo looked at that copy, I was like, are they serious? I'm trying as much as possible to divorce TK from, from copyright. But there's the issue of having the digital library. So basically most of the, that content as a catalog and everything would be protected under copyright. So you have the issue of the applications that you can use to create and store the works. So it will also promote the access for works. As you know about derivative works and works inspired by copyright, like we're talking about the albums that were done on um, lullabies. We've got so many designs. When you go into the Maasai market on Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, wherever it is, you find that there are so many designs. Most of them, like if you're looking at the, the uh, Kamba uh, wood carvings, that is somebody's creative work. So for instance, if someone came up with a, a soap dish or a candle holder or whatever it is, traditionally we never had the candle. So somebody used the traditional knowledge to carve something and basically that work, they own the copyright in it. But unfortunately what happens is that somebody is going to take that work and normally when something starts selling, the Maasai sandals, I get a pair of nice sandals from the market and uh, the next time I turn up at the Maasai market, practically every stall owner has the same. Most of them don't understand that it's actually somebody's uh, intellectual property work, which has been developed from existing traditional um, knowledge. I don't know how many of you remember this. And I think immediately after that, there was a lot of, there was a huge uproar as to, seriously, you know, has anybody ever thought of, and by the way, this is what they'll say, Louis Vuitton inspired by Africa, you know? Amazingly, you know, like they don't care, the Maasai are all over Africa, so it's not inspired by the Maasai, whatever it is, it's inspired by Africa. So you see, this is somebody who has taken existing, you know, the Shukas, they've had it for a certain period of time. It might not, it might not be traditional knowledge, it might not be protected under traditional cultural expressions, but if we had a TK Commons, 
you know, it would be something that you can actually put out there. So when Louis Vuitton puts it out there, he will not say inspired by Africa. He'd probably say the property of the Maasai community or something like that, you know, that'd be very specific about it and give the proper attribution to that particular work. And I think if you go to the internet and look at that, you'll find an entire catalog of works. They got a rave review for most of this. And our designers are sitting cream, pretty, and relax, not seeing what is happening. This is just an example, but there are so many things. If you're going to look at the traditional attire, the many things that you can do with them. When you are growing up, the kikoi was basically used just as a sarong or a wrapper. But now you have kikoi hats, handbags, you know. If you walk through any of the Maasai markets or the duty-free shops in, in, at the airport, it's nothing but kikoi, 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 kikoi. So the thing is that how do we ensure that we have a policy framework that will support this traditional knowledge commons that will allow people to know first and foremost where that work is coming from. So if you're not shocked when you see something over there and you're like, how did they do it? Where did they get it from? And if they do use it, then at least they acknowledge it. This is, unfortunately, I was not able to get to download courtesy of Strathmore and their mini. I should have actually downloaded before I came. Enigma, Return to Innocence. How many of you remember that song? You have never heard this Return to Innocence. It has 13 million hits on YouTube. <laughs> I knew, I mean, I'm dealing with Generation X over. Is it Y or Z? <laughs> so if, if you get time, the Return to Innocence, this is just an area to show you how people take traditional cultural expressions and use the song. The video is amazing. The music is fantastic. So I tell you, since it was uploaded in 2009, it has 13 million hits. It's a pretty sad song. The chants and everything that came from actually came from the army, uh, army uh, community in Asia. So you find that these people came, they had them, they decided to incorporate, you know, like the sampling in the music and everything. And basically that's what makes the essence of the song, the chants and everything. If you have time, please take time and look for uh, Return to Innocence by the group called Enigma. So these people have made a lot of money so the army, uh, basically, the, the, this particular community, the two characters who are involved, I think it was some, some, um, one of these cultural festivals that you have in, in Europe. So they took these guys to, to court, but uh, fortunately they managed to settle the matter out of court. So there are, many, there are so many other areas you can look into and you see we actually do have a gold mine when it comes to traditional cultural expressions. We can exploit it. If those are tra traditional knowledge commons, I don't think this would have happened. And if it would have, they would have gone to the rights owners, or rather the custodians, because when you're talking about the indigenous and local communities, they're mainly the custodians of the TK, and they would have got that authority to use that work without having to, to get into legal battles on that issue. And then the Maasai market, as you all know, uh, most of the works you find in the Maasai market are actually derived from traditional work, or they're inspired by traditional cultural uh, expressions. So with the TK Commons, it would be possible to have the traditional expressions documented and made available to third parties based on a Commons license. And I think this is something similar that's being done in South Africa with the Bushback community. Yeah. Uh, one of the respondents said, this is one of the quotations, is like if an elder dies, basically he dies with the knowledge. They need to have a clear policy uh, framework to facilitate the TK uh, Commons. Right now, as I told you, the Kenya Copyright Board is the one that's spearheading the whole legislative process, the, the policy issue. And I was thinking, the, the, the good thing about that is that it puts us in a position. We have the policy framework which, to a certain extent, does allow uh, the creation of the traditional knowledge commons. But we have the opportunity in the drafting of the TK law to ensure that we have provision that will facilitate a traditional uh, knowledge commons. So, thank you.